Hello, welcome to my program on the decision-making process. My name is Bob Seshadri. I'm referring to David Garvin and Michael Roberto's research on this. Leaders are made or broken by the quality of the decisions. Research states that when a decision needs to be taken, most leaders take a decision at one point in time based on experience, gut feel, research, or all three. This method may not be entirely correct. The fact is decision making is a process. One has to take time over it. Research shows that difference between leaders who make good and bad decisions is striking. Good decision makers believe a decision making is a process and thus design and manage them while the rest erroneously feel decisions are something that they alone control. Thus, uh, the decision making process unfolds over weeks and months, in some cases years, as you would have noticed. Let's treat decision making as a process and have a look at it. There are two broad approaches to a decision making process. You know, one is called advocacy, another is called inquiry. Let's tackle advocacy. When a group takes on an advocacy perspective, participants are passionate about their preferred solutions and therefore stand firm in front of opposition without even caring to look at their opposing arguments. The objective in this case is more about winning. A lot of facts tend to get shoved under the carpet, like important conflicting data that may undermine their argument. The, largest, the larger interest of the organization gets lost here. In this method, personalities and egos come to play and differences are resolved by a lot of behind the curtain maneuvers. The decision is taken by the more powerful being supported by their own groups. This approach suppresses innovation and encourages participants to go along with the dominant view to avoid further conflict. Then there is this process of inquiry. This is the preferred option. It's a very open process that is designed to generate multiple alternatives, foster the exchange of ideas, and thus produce a well-tested opinion. This is a method that I've successfully used over the years by having staff and superiors to buy into the idea and then arrive at a decision that encompasses all options. I found this uh, less conflicting. An inquiry-based group carefully considers various options and works together to arrive at the best possible solution. Let us remember, while groups will have their own interests within the hearts of their opinions, the objective is not to persuade the group to arrive at their point of view, but to come to an agreement on the best course of action benefiting the whole organization. Information should be shared in the raw form, allowing participants to draw their own conclusion from the given data. This process allows critical thinking. All participants feel comfortable raising alternative solutions and asking hard questions about the possibilities already on the table. Teams involved in the inquiry process rigorously question the proposals and assumptions they rest on so that they'll will be conflict, but it's rarely personal. This is because disagreements revolve around ideas and interpretations rather than entrenched positions. The conflicts are thus healthy and differences are resolved by applying the rules of reason. The ego is not allowed to play a part here. The solutions therefore will arrive from a test of strength among competing ideas rather than having dueling positions. So, if you compare the two very quickly, you will see the concept of decision making under the advocacy would be treated as a contest, whereas under inquiry, it will be collaborative and problem solving. If you look at the purpose of discussion, advocacy principle is largely persuasion and lobbying. 
an inquiry process is testing and evaluation. If you look at the participants' role, it, the people who are following the advocacy principle would largely be spokespeople, whereas the people who advocate the inquiry process are critical thinkers. If you look at the patterns of behavior, people who, who promote advocacy would be, they'll strive to persuade others, they defend their position and downplay their weakness. Whereas the other group will give present balanced arguments, remain open to alternatives and accept constructive criticism. The minority views, if you look at it, it will be discouraged or dismissed by the group that promotes advocacy. Whereas the ones who promote inquiry will be, they'll value it and they'll ask them to explain further. And when you look at the outcome, the advocacy principle, they, they have either winners or losers. Whereas in the inquiry, method, you have a collective ownership. Therefore, leaders seeking to improve the organization's decision-making abilities need to begin with a single goal. Moving as quickly as possible from the process of advocacy to the process of inquiry. This process will involve the three C's of effective decision-making, which are conflict, consideration and closure. Let's tackle constructive conflict. Conflict comes in two forms, cognitive and effective. The cognitive forms involve disagreement over ideas, assumptions and different views on the best ways to proceed. This is crucial to an effective inquiry as it draws out the real weaknesses and introduces new ideas. The effective form involves emotion, personal agenda, rivalries, old issues, friction and clashing personalities. This diminishes the will to cooperate during the implementation and renders the decision making process less effective. The two types of conflicts are surprisingly hard to separate. Look at it. People tend to take any criticism personally and react defensively. You'll notice this all the time. So even if a good decision emerges, it becomes difficult for the participants to cooperate during the implementation if it is not their idea. The challenge is therefore to increase con you know, the cognitive conflict and keep the effective conflict under control. The next one is consideration. Once alternatives are dismissed and a decision has been made, there will be a set of people whose options were not taken. And they would resist or they would grudgingly, you know, accept uh, the decision. The critical factor is that those whose ideas were not taken must feel that their ideas were considered. They must feel it. And that they did have an opportunity in the decision making process. Once they feel that the leader genuinely considered their point, even if it was not taken, they will still cooperate <clears throat> during the implementation process. Leaders must demonstrate consideration throughout the decision making process. For this to happen right from the very beginning, the meeting conveyor must convey openness to new ideas and willingness to accept views that differ from their own. Meeting conveyors must never suggest their minds are made up. They should also avoid disclosing their personal preferences during the early stages of the meeting. During the meeting, make eye contact. Leaders must exercise patience whilst listening to participants explaining their positions. Take notes. This indicates that you know you are listening to them. You're, this indicates that they are considering all their points laid out before arriving at the final decision. Once a decision has been reached, the convener must then explain their logic and the rationale for their decision. They need to explain how each participant's suspicion affected the final decision and explain clearly why they chose to differ from those views. Then comes closure. One must ensure the end of the deliberation is neither too early nor too late. What happens if you decide too early? In order to be considered a team player, the group readily accepts the first plausible option without engaging in critical thinking or questioning the assumptions. This sort of group thinking happens when the leader has his group members 
or board members who look to see which way the wind is blowing or ones who want to agree with the chairman or the owner of the company. Happens all the time. This happens especially with new teams too, whose members are still trying to find their feet and they would not like to be seen as uh, the dissenters. The trouble with such group thinking is that unstated objections would surface at a time when aligned and cooperative action is required. It's essential towards when, when you go towards implementation. Leaders must learn to identify discontent and address them immediately by encouraging them to voice the dissent and revisit the points. And deciding too late. One of the factors that contribute to a delayed decision could be the process of deliberating over each and every submission. Trying to resolve every question before arriving at a conclusion is another, another major hindrance. It is all in the effort to be fair, I agree. At times, two groups reach a deadlock, each restating their position over and over again. And that creates an endless loop. Any member can also send everybody off on a tangent by voicing their doubts. Meanwhile, pressure from the market forces could force your hand at a decision that is not fully thought out. Unfortunately, the effectiveness of a decision can be found out only after the fact. By the time the results are in, then it's normally too late. However, the best way to find out if you're on the right track is to periodically assess the decision-making process, although it's already in the process. Multiple alternatives are the route that shows the process has been well thought out. Usually, groups are requested to provide two alternatives to a solution. One is assumption testing and the other one is a well-defined criteria. In like under assumption testing, assum the facts come in two varieties. One that has been carefully tested and the others arising out of assertiveness and assumptions. Effective decision makers belong to the uh, group who have carefully tested it out. Though most of their arguments may be supported by hard evidence, some may be shrouded in ambiguity. Appoint a separate group to look for such ambiguity and question them. A well-defined criteria invariably advocates of this group will suggest measures that favor their preferred alternative, like net income return on capital market presence, share of voice, a number of eyeballs covered, you know, and so on. To avoid long delays, the team should specify upfront and visit them periodically during the decision-making process. Many a time when a deadline looms up, compromises are made on values that were considered immovable in order to complete the decision-making process, be done with it. Keeping people involved in the process continuously is perhaps the most important factor in the decision-making process. Many of us, without realizing, tend to fall into the advocacy or the autocratic pattern purely to avoid delays and confrontations. The qualities that leaders need to exercise, therefore, is to promote conflict while accepting ambiguity. Look at the ambiguity carefully, go into the details. The wisdom to know when to bring the conversation to a close, delicately. The patience to help others understand the logic behind your choice. The ability to embrace divergence during the discussions. And the ability to bring in unity during the final implementation. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. See you in my next program.